right, good morning, everyone. Um, we will, I will call this hearing to order, and first I'll go over just a few ha housekeeping matters before I turn it over to Mr. Butler to read the docket. First, let me just say this is the first time we are live streaming. Um, ETV has provided these wonderful cameras and cameramen, so smile for the camera, everyone. Um, we are delighted to be doing this, um, making our process more transparent and allowing more people to participate and view our hearings. So again, smile. Um, as far as schedule is concerned, we will break for lunch at around 12.30. I'll try to take a break about every hour and a half. Um, and hopefully we'll get done today. Um, and we'll probably go as long as we can today just to get done today. Um, since we are doing both Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress in sort of a parallel hearing, um, I'll just ask that each party and each witness use Duke Energy Progress or Duke Energy Carolinas rather than the um, acronym DEC or DEP, just because it's hard to distinguish um, for our audience out there and, and audience in, here in the hearing room. Um, I think that's it, so now I will turn it over to Mr. Butler to read the docket. Thank you, Madam Chair and other members of the Commission. Uh, we're here today regarding docket numbers 2015-53E and 2015-55E, which are the applications of Duke Energy Progress Incorporated and Duke Energy Carolinas LLC to establish distributed energy resource programs for their respective companies in concert with Act 236. The two dockets have been consolidated for hearing purposes before the Commission today. Uh, you'll please take notice that a hearing on these matters has been scheduled to begin on Tuesday, May 19, 2015 at 10.30 a.m. before the Commission on the Commission in the Commission's hearing room at 101 Executive Center Drive, Saluda Building, Columbia, South Carolina, for the purpose of receiving testimony and evidence from all interested parties. Uh, Madam Chair and other members of the Commission, both dockets are in order. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And if we can get uh, appearances from all parties, please. I guess we will start with Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress. Okay, um, another um, little housekeeping matter. Every time you are speaking, please find a microphone. There should be one somewhere close, so. Okay, um, and for Nucor Steel. Okay, thank you. And for Walmart stores. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Stephanie Roberts. I'm here on behalf of Walmart, uh, Walmart Stores Inc. and Walmart uh, Sam Foods Inc. And um, can you hear me now? Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. And f I'm sorry. I'm not sure that Walmart okay, yeah. It, um, they're on now. Okay, yeah. If you'll just make sure that the red lights are on for those smaller microphones. And for the South Carolina Energy Users Committee. Madam Chair, I'm Scott Elliott. I represent the energy users in this docket. Both these dockets. Okay. Thank you. And for the Alliance for Solar Choice. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Thad Culley, the law firm Keys, Fox & Weedman, on behalf of the Alliance for Solar Choice. And I'm joined by... Good morning, Joe McCullough, back again. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. McCullough. All right, and for the Sierra Club. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Robert Gile to Columbia for the Sierra Club. Okay. Um, and for Sustainable Energy Solutions and Solbridge Energy. Madam Chair and other Commissioners, I'm Richard Witt from Austin and Rogers. Okay. And for the South Carolina Solar Business Alliance. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm Bonnie Loomis here for the South Carolina Solar Business Alliance. And I'm hoping that the Chairwoman has been apprised of a conflict that I have a need to be at the State House. 
to pursue legislation that is actually in furtherance of Act 236 and in cooperation with the investor owned utilities in the Alliance for Solar Choice and the um, environmental interest groups. And I would like to ask permission to be excused. My client is the Solar Business Alliance. The board chair is Paul Flurry, who is here in case he's needed. We have not filed testimony. Paul is actually with Sustainable Energy Solutions, which is represented by Richard Witt, and Richard has agreed to take any issues that may be needed in my absence. Okay. All right. Well, if no other parties have any objection to Ms. Loomis leaving, then uh, I'm fine to excuse you. You know about what time or? As soon as possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, bye. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Good morning, Madam Chair, Members of Commission, Bland Hallman from the Southern Environmental Law Center on behalf of Coastal Conservation League and the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Okay, thank you and welcome. And finally for ORS. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission representing ORS, Andrew Bateman and Shannon Hudson. All right, good morning. <coughs> okay, and are there any preliminary matters we need to begin or anything we need to put into the record? Mr. Bateman. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of the Commission. On May 12th, we filed a settlement agreement for both docket number 2015-53E and docket number 2015-55E. You may hear us call these the DERP dockets, with DERP being short for Distributed Energy Resource Program. In each docket, the settlement agreement was signed by all parties except the Sierra Club. However, the Sierra Club has given ORS permission to share that it supports both settlement agreements. <laughs> ORS thanks all parties their flexibility and willingness to work together. This settlement is very much a collaborative product and an amicable compromise. We believe it is in the public interest. The settlement agreements outline aspects of each company's distributed energy resource program and are designed to allow the companies to meet the criteria set forth in Act 236. The applications and settlements are essentially identical. Specifically, the settlement agreements provide the details behind forming a DERP collaborative group the methods to incent the development by 2021 of renewable energy facilities located in South Carolina, the retention of renewable energy certificates, cost recovery, and how a DERP plan could be modified. In addition, the parties to the settlement agree not to cross-examine the witnesses of other settlement parties. Madam Chairman, at this time, and if there are no objections, I ask that the settlement agreement for docket number 2015-53E be marked for identification and entered into the record as the first hearing exhibit for docket 2015-53E. All right, the settlement agreement will be entered into the record as hearing exhibit number one for Duke Energy Progress and number one for Duke Energy Carolinas. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes all preliminary matters for ORS. Okay. All right, thank you. Are there any parties that would like to give an opening statement? Mr. Gow? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, I'd just like to make a statement briefly on behalf of the Sierra Club. Uh, um, as uh, Mr. Bateman related for ORS, uh, we too compliment the parties and ORS for working diligently to reach this settlement. Sierra Club uh, uh, will not be a party to the settlement, but as he related, uh, we have no objection to its adoption and support it, and uh, what wish to compliment the parties and the Commission for moving forward on the support. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gobb. Any other parties that wish to make a brief opening statement? Okay, is there any member of the public that would wish to address the commission at this time? Okay, all right. Um, Mr. Castle, then you may present your case whenever you're ready, sir. Yes. Okay, Ms. Felt, uh, I'm going to go with you first, and then we'll um, do Mr. Marino after that. Um, can you please state your full name and business address for the record? 
uh, Emily Osborne Felt, business address 400 South Tryon Street, Charlotte, North Carolina. And by whom are you employed and in what capacity? Duke Energy Corporation. I'm employed as a manager of policy and strategy in our distributed energy resources group. Um, just for your information, the Commission's information, I'm going to go through this um, first for docket number 2015-53E uh, e on behalf of Duke Energy Progress, and then followed by uh, Duke, uh, docket number 2015-55E for Duke Energy Carolinas. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Now, Ms. Felt, uh, in docket number 2015-53E, did you cause to be pre-filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress um, 11 pages of direct testimony? Yes. Do you have any changes or corrections to that testimony at this time? Yes, I do. On the title page and in the footer of my direct testimony, the docket number should be 2015-53E. Two, Subject to those changes, uh, if I asked you the same questions included within your testimony today, would your answers remain the same? Yes. Uh, did you also cause to be pre-filed in this docket six pages of rebuttal testimony? Yes. Do you have any changes or corrections to your rebuttal testimony at this time? Yes, I do. On page two of my rebuttal testimony, on line 12, please delete starting at the word and through the abbreviation CCL on line 13. Subject to that change, if I answered you, if I asked you those same questions today, would your answers remain the same? Yes, they would. <coughs> Madam Chair, at this time, I'd like to have Ms. Felt's direct and rebuttal testimony pre-filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress entered into the record as if given or orally from the stand. All right, Ms. Felt's, Ms. Felt's pre-filed um, direct and rebuttal testimony will be entered into the record, um, read into the record as if given orally from the stand. Ms. Felt, do you have a summary of your testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress? I do. Can you please provide it at this time? My direct testimony supports the application of Duke Energy Progress, Inc. to establish a distributed energy resource, or DER, program and to demonstrate how the proposed portfolio of DER initiatives will fulfill the goals of Act 236 specifically to, quote, promote the establishment of a reliable, efficient, and diversified portfolio of distributed energy resources for the state, end quote. The company's DER program has been designed to increase the capacity of solar generation located in its service area from 100 kilowatts as of January 1, 2015, to approximately 27 megawatts by January 1, 2021. The company proposes to meet half of the total capacity target through the introduction of three new customer offers. One, the DER net, meet, net energy metering incentive. Two, a solar rebate program. And three, a shared solar program. These programs are designed to incent residential and non-residential customers to invest in or lease these facilities, both on and off premise. Also included in the company's application is a description of the company's plan to meet the balance of the capacity requirement through procurement of renewable energy from large-scale solar facilities located in South Carolina. The company's DER NEM incentive will be available to eligible net energy metering customer generators and will enable the customer to enjoy full retail rate credit for their net metered generation for a period of time as defined in the settlement agreement in docket number 2014-246-E. The solar rebate program is a new tariff designed to encourage homeowners and businesses to install solar energy systems on site by providing assistance in the form of a dollar per watt rebate with the capital requirements of a solar investment. Customers who install solar energy systems up to one megawatt in size after January 1, 2015 may apply for the rebate. These customers may combine the rebate with the company's net energy metering tariff or with the company's standard power purchase agreement in South Carolina, Schedule CSP30A. The shared solar program will allow multiple customers to subscribe to and share in the benefits of one renewable energy facility. Although it is designed for customer ho customers holding tax exempt status, such as houses of worship, schools, universities, military installation, and government offices. This option will be accessible to a wide array of eligible residential or non-residential customers. 
The company expects the program will have strong appeal to residential and commercial customers who rent their premise, to residential customers who reside in multifamily housing units or even shaded housing, and to residential customers for whom the relatively high upfront costs of solar PV make the technology unattainable. The shared generating assets will be located throughout the company's South Carolina retail service area, built in, built in increments no greater than 1,000 kilowatts and ground mounted rather than roof mounted. To meet the balance of its capacity requirement, the company also intends to solicit 13 megawatts of solar photovoltaic capacity through a request for proposals between, for facilities between 1 megawatt and 10 megawatts located in its service territory in South Carolina. The company will require that facilities are in service before the end of 2016, such that pricing will reflect the benefits of federal investment tax credits which, is set, which are set to expire December 31, 2016. The company's application meets the requirements that the Gen General Assembly set forth in Act 236, as well as the terms of the settlement agreement reached in Docket 2014-246-E. Fulfillment of the goals of Act 236 and the terms of the settlement agreement were the primary design principles around which this portfolio of initiatives was crafted. And we believe these programs and incentives offer meaningful benefits to customers choosing to install DER generation and will drive adoption to meet the capacity requirements of the Act. This concludes my direct testimony. My rebuttal testimony responds to certain aspects of the testimony of the Coastal Conservation League witness Hamilton Davis and the Alliance for Solar Choice witness Justin Barnes relating to the use of subscriptions for shared solar program, subscriptions from the shared solar program to comply with the Act 236 capacity requirements for small installations, the siting of shared solar facilities, the portability and transferability of shared solar subscriptions, the payment term for shared solar initial subscriptions, and the calendar year participation limits for the solar rebate program. This concludes the summary of my rebuttal testimony. Following the filing of my rebuttal testimony, the company entered into a comprehensive settlement agreement with the South Carolina Office of Regulatory Staff, Walmart, Walmart Stores East, LP, and Sam's East, Inc., Nucor Steel, South Carolina, the Alliance for Solar Choice, South Carolina Energy Users Committee, South Carolina Coastal Conservation League, and the Alliance for Solar, and the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, the South Carolina Solar Business Alliance, LLC, and Solbridge Energy, LLC, and Sustainable Energy Solutions, LLC. The agreement was filed with the Commission on May 12, 2015. The agreement establishes the parameters for DEP's, Duke Energy Progress's, DER program, which has been designed to promote the development of distributed energy resources in South Carolina and achieve the capacity and programmatic requirements of South Carolina Code 58-39-130C13 through its utility, scale, and customer initiatives. The agreement further establishes program modification guidelines and a collaborative working group to support the implementation of Duke Energy Progress's DER program. The agreement also outlines the manner in which DER incremental and avoided costs will be allocated and recovered from customers in such a manner that will ensure that the total incremental costs recovered from each of Duke Energy Progress's retail customer classes will not exceed the statutory limits set forth in South Carolina Code 58-39-150. The company submits that the agreement is reasonable and should be approved as its terms are in the public interest and will effectively further the goals and the implementation of the Act. This concludes my summary. Thank you. Now switching to uh, docket number 2015-55-E on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas. Did you cause to be pre-filed in this docket uh, 11 pages of direct testimony? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes or corrections to that testimony at this time? Yes, I do. It's the same page uh, or same correction that I indicated in the earlier docket. 
On the title page and in the footer, the docket number should be 2015-55-E. And subject to those changes, if I asked you those same questions today, would your answers remain the same? Yes. Did you also cause to be pre-filed in that docket uh, six pages of rebuttal testimony? Yes, I did. Uh, do you have any changes or corrections to that rebuttal testimony at this time? Yes, I do. It's the same change on page 2, lines 12 and 13 of the rebuttal. Please delete starting at the word and on line 12 through the abbre abbreviation CCL on line 13. And subject to those changes, if I asked you those same questions included within your rebuttal testimony, would your answers remain the same? They would. Madam Chair, at this time, I'd like to have uh, Ms. Felt's direct and rebuttal testimony pre-filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas um, entered into the docket as if given orally from the stand. All right, Ms. Phelps, direct and rebuttal testimony for Duke Energy Carolinas will be read into the record as if given orally from the stand. And Ms. Felt, did you also prepare a summary of your testimony filed in the Duke Energy Carolinas docket? Yes, I did. Can you please provide it at this time? Mm -hmm. For the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas, LLC, in docket number 2015-55-E, I will adopt the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress, Inc., provided in docket number 2015-53-E, subject to the following change specific to Duke Energy Carolinas, DER, program application. Duke Energy Carolina's DER program has been designed to increase the capacity of solar generation located in its service area from 1.3 megawatts as of January 1, 2015 to approximately 84 megawatts by January 1, 2021. In all other respects, the summary of my testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress provides the summary of my testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolina's. This concludes the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony. Thank you. Moving to Mr. Marino. Can you please provide your name and business address for the record? My name is Jose Merino. And if you can turn that mic on, Mr. Marino, the, when the red light is on, it's not that one. Hello. Okay. I think it's on now. Okay, and by whom are you employed and in what capacity? I'm employed by Duke Energy Corporation and I'm the Director of Renewable Analytics. Okay, and did you cause to be pre-filed in this docket 22 pages of direct testimony and two confidential exhibits? Yes, I did. Okay, and just to be clear, I'm referring to uh, the docket for Duke Energy Progress's application 2015-53E. Uh, do you have any changes or corrections to that direct testimony or those supporting exhibits? I do not. Okay. If I asked you those same questions included within your direct testimony today, would your answers remain the same? Yes, they would. Did you also cause to be pre-filed in this docket uh, nine pages of rebuttal testimony? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes to that rebuttal testimony at this time? I do not at this time. And if I asked you those same questions included within your rebuttal testimony, would your answers remain the same? Yes, they would. At this time, Madam Chair, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Marino's direct and rebuttal testimony uh, filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress entered into the record as if given orally from the stand, and to have both his public and confidential exhibits to his direct testimony marked as pre-filed. Okay. Um, Mr. Marino's direct and rebuttal testimony will be read into the record as if given orally from the stand. His exhibits one and two will be entered into the record as hearing exhibit number two. Thank you. Mr. Marino, did you prepare a summary of your uh, direct and rebuttal testimony? Yes, I did. Can you please provide it at this time? My direct testimony explains that for utilities that choose to participate in a DER program, pursuant to Act 236, it specifically requires the utility to, one, invest in or procure 1% of South Carolina retail peak capacity from large-scale renewable energy facilities, no less than 1,000 kW and no greater than 10,000 kW in nameplate capacity, referred to as Tier 1. And two, 
established programs to encourage customers to purchase or lease renewable energy facilities no greater than 1,000 kW in capacity that, in aggregate, are equivalent in nameplate capacity to 1% of South Carolina retail peak capacity, of which 25% must be from facilities less than 20 kW in nameplate capacity, referred to as Tier 2. The company's proposed DER portfolio was designed to meet the nameplate capacity goals associated with large-scale renewable facilities up to 10,000 kW and to promote the necessary investment in small-scale renewable facilities that can serve residential, commercial, and industrial customers and meet the aggregate nameplate capacity requirements for facilities less than 1,000 kW. The company projects to bring online a total of 27 megawatts of installed capacity between 2015 and 2020 through the implementation of Tier 1 and Tier 2 programs. The projected breakdown of total DER capacity by tier is as follows. For Tier 1, 13 megawatts, and for Tier 2, 14 megawatts. To meet its Tier 1 requirements, the company plans to issue an RFP to solicit utility-scale solar, photovoltaic PPA, and utility-scale solar turnkey projects in its service territory in South Carolina. Bidders will be asked to submit proposals for projects greater than 1 megawatt and equal or less than 10 megawatts, with a desired contract term of 10 years in a target and service date prior to December 31, 2016. The proposals will be evaluated based on a set of attributes as prescribed by the company's competitive bid bidding process. The company believes that relying on an RFP for utility-scale solar facilities is a cost-effective approach to comply with the Tier 1 capacity requirements promote the benefits of the proposed DER portfolio and increase awareness about the new DER market structure in South Carolina. To meet its Tier 2 requirements, the company will rely upon a combination of customer programs, including the DER Net Energy Metering Incentive Program, the Solar Rebate Program, and the Shared Solar Program. The DER NEM Incentive will be available to existing and new NEM customers who take service under the company's new NEM tariffs prior to December 31, 2020. The DER NEM incentive will expire at the end of 2025 and will be fully funded by the company's DER program through the end of 2025. The DER NEM incentive represents the additional embedded incentive that must be provided to a NEM customer generator for that customer generator to receive a full one-to-one -one <coughs> retail rate credit and was approved by the commission in docket number 2015-246-E. The company's solar rebate program is a new tariff that promotes investment growth in DER technologies through an upfront cash payment based on a stated dollar per watt DC of installed nameplate capacity. The solar rebate will be available to residential and non-residential customers who desire to purchase or lease a DER on their property, <coughs> with residential customers receiving a one-time $1 per watt rebate and non-residential customers receiving $0.75 cents per watt rebate from the utility once all of the tariff conditions are met. The contract period for the solar rebate is five years and customers have an option of early termination subject to payment of reasonable termination charges. The company estimated and derived the solar rebate using the best available information for solar rooftop costs, current tax credits, economic conditions, and customer preferences in its service area. And we believe that the proposed rebate amounts for residential and for non-residential customers will be sufficient to achieve the installed capacity targets set forth in Act 236. The company's plan is to periodically evaluate the level and effectiveness of the solar rebate program based on past performance and market research, and it will propose to adjust it in the future as market conditions change. The Shared Solar Program is a subscription-based DER offer that is designed principally for customers that do not have adequate rooftops, that hold a tax-exempt status, that live in multifamily housing where it may be difficult to obtain the proper permits to install solar, that rent or lease their home for customers who do not have the capital or credit score to afford to purchase or lease a solar array. By paying a monthly subscription and small upfront charges, 
multiple participants can subscribe to a pro rata share of the energy produced by a ground mount solar facility for a period of 10 years. Shared solar customers will receive a monthly energy credit based on the actual KWH generated by their solar subscription and the energy credit will be based on the value of DER methodology prescribed in the NEM settlement agreement. In addition, subscribers will pay the company for all energy consumed at the prevailing retail rate. The shared solar customer charges and credits were designed such that participating customers experience a bill savings of approximately $25 per KW subscribed during the first few years of operation of the solar facility with a simple payback period of approximately four years. The proposed level of incentives included in the shared solar offer were developed to produce approximately 9% bill savings in year one for a typical residential customer. And the company believes that the expected bill savings and short payback period will be sufficient to entice customers within the shared solar target segments to subscribe to the program. The program is targeted to tax exempt and government entities among other segments and the company intends to use it to meet the requirements of South Carolina Code 58-39-130C3 relating to programs for tax exempt and government entities. The company believes that the proposed shared solar incentives are also adequate to drive the required penetration of shared solar needed to meet the company's tier two DER capacity requirements. Collectively, the utility scale RFP and proposed customer offers included in the company's proposed DER portfolio include tangible and meaningful incentives that will drive the necessary customer adoption and achieve the targets stipulated in Act 236. The programs included in, D in the DER portfolio were designed to be cost effective and easy to implement administer and monitor. Ultimately, customers' response will dictate the achievement of the Tier 1 and Tier 2 capacity requirements, but this portfolio provides strong customer offers designed to incent the required adoption by 2021 and provide the right amount of stimulus to the industry, considering available tax credits, current DER install costs, and electricity prices. This concludes the summary of my direct testimony. My rebuttal testimony responds to the testimony of Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and Coastal Conservation League witness John D. Wilson, CCL witness Hamilton Davis, and the Alliance for Solar Choice witness Justin Barnes filed in this docket relating to the term of PPA solicited through the RFP, the company's proposed solar rebate levels and participation term for subscribers to the shared solar program. In my rebuttal testimony, I recommend the commission allow the company to proceed as set forth within its application regarding the term of PPA solicited through the RFP, its proposed solar rebate levels, and proposed shared solar term. This concludes the summary of my rebuttal testimony. Thank you. Now moving to uh, docket 2015-55-E um, in your testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas. Uh, did you cause to be pre-filed in that docket the 22 pages of direct testimony with two supporting confidential exhibits? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes to that testimony or those exhibits at this time? I do not. Uh, if I asked you those same questions today, would your answers remain the same? They would remain the same. Did you also cause to be pre-filed in the docket nine pages of rebuttal testimony? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes to that rebuttal testimony at this time? I do not. If I asked you those same questions within your rebuttal testimony, would your answers remain the same? Yes, they would. Madam Chair, at this time, I'd ask that Mr. Marino's direct and rebuttal testimony be entered into the record as if given orally from the stand, and that his uh, two confidential and public exhibits be marked as pre-filed. All right. Um, Mr. Marino's direct and rebuttal testimony for <laughs> Duke Energy Carolinas will be read into the record as if given orally for the, from the stand. His um, exhibits one and two will be entered into the record as hearing exhibit number two. Mr. Marino, did you prepare a summary of your direct and rebuttal testimony? Yes, I did. Can you please provide it at this time? Sure. For the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas, LLC, 
in docket number 2015-55-E, I will adopt the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress, Inc., provided in docket number 2015-53-E, subject to the following change specific to Duke Energy Carolina's DER program application. Duke Energy Carolina's projects to bring online a total of 84 megawatts of installed capacity between 2015 and 2020 through the implementation of Tier 1 and Tier 2 programs. The projected breakdown of total DER capacity by tier is as follows. For Tier 1, 40 megawatts, and for Tier 2, 44 megawatts. In all other respects, the summary of my testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress provides the summary of my testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas. This concludes the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony. Thank you. Madam Chair, the witnesses are available for questions from the Commission. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Gallup, since you have not signed on to the settlement agreement, you have reserved your right to cross-examine. Do you have any questions for? No, um, no questions, okay, all right, Commissioner's questions. Madam Chair. Commissioner Randall. And Mr. Marino, thank you for being here today. Um, I've just got a couple of uh, clarification questions, I guess, from your um, testimony. Uh, first, Ms. Felt, um, if you go to page 12 of the application, you're talking about the, um, the need to install revenue grade meters at net metered customers generators, customer generators premises. Is that is revenue grade meter? Is that an upgrade from um, the smart meter, or is it is it something totally different? And would you just sort of tell us what that is? Certainly, Commissioner. And Jose, please jump in if you know more about this. Revenue grade, I think, is our standard for meter installation. It's uh, not terribly different from what we have today. So, and if if you're um, is a revenue grade or smart meter when you're talking about installing is this going to be the will you have to change a meter for someone going into a net metering um, um, agreement or is it is it will you use the meter that's already there is it if it's your standard commissioner may i allow my colleague to answer Absolutely. the question commissioner um, we believe it will vary by case but our intent is to install a new meter if that meter is required um, per the net metering tariff and uh, if the meter that's in place is adequate, um, we don't intend to replace that meter. Is, is that kind of, if, if a special meter, is that charged directly to that customer or is it just included, will it be rolled into rate base somehow? Uh, the metering cost that uh, will be required per the net energy metering tariff that are necessary to enable the program uh, will be charged to the DER program. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, just, just one other quick question um, from uh, Mr. Marino from page six of your direct testimony. You're, you're talking about um, the minimal market activity for solar scale um, projects. Um, how do you, how do the companies intend to uh, get good or meaningful market uh, pricing information from the RFP responses and, and why do you think you've got such minimal market activity right now? Uh, to answer your first question, um, Commissioner, we believe that RFP is the best avenue, especially for large, the large scale part of our program, to receive transparent pricing and obtain uh, meaningful market information. Uh, the process is, um, has been tested in the past and we have a group of people that are have experience in, in performing the, the RFPs of this nature. Um, and to answer your second question, uh, the level of activity that we believe exists in South Carolina right now, it is low because of um, the current economic conditions. And that's precisely why we believe our application and our program is the right avenue to provide the incentives to the market so the activity increases. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Commissioner Randall. Commissioners, Commissioner Fleming. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to have you here today. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the education programs that you will have in place. 
anytime there's a new program like this, uh, it's very, the success of the program depends a lot on the education and the education of the some consumer so that they, that will support their making informed decisions. Um, so with that in mind, could you please walk me through the process that a customer would take to have solar panels installed at their residence under the company's uh, DER program? Certainly. The, a residential customer may hear about solar in the newspaper or through one of these uh, programs called Solarize, where uh, several installers may do joint marketing together and target a specific community. There's one of those going on in Columbia right now, I understand. Um, the Solarize folks, uh, again, these are not utility representatives, but instead representatives of installers, um, will hold educational sessions. There was one held at the Columbia Museum of Art the other day. Uh, public informative sessions as to what solar costs are, what solar can do for your energy bill, and what it can't do for your energy bill. Um, these are efforts, I think, to address the education aspects of it uh, that installers are voluntarily taking because they know that this is um, a rather costly home improvement. Um, as far as what steps my company will take, um, we intend to put out a frequently asked questions list for installers, um, a checklist um, for uh, installers and homeowners. We have a solar service 1-800 number that a customer may call and say, and we get these calls every day actually. Um, somebody's approached me about putting solar on my home and they've quoted me this or that. Is that true? Um, it's not exactly, we, we don't intend to give advice, it's really a technical line for interconnection applications and things like that, but uh, we do field those questions. So a customer receives information, they're interested in solar, they, uh, they build a relationship with an installer. That customer or that installer may apply on behalf of the customer if the customer designates the installer as his representative um, online for our solar rebate. And our rebate's um, $1,000 a kilowatt. Uh, the average uh, homeowner would install five kilowatts DC, four kilowatts AC. Um, so that would be roughly a $5,000 subsidy. Um, so they would fill out an application online. Um, on that same online platform, they would also fill out an interconnection application. Um, and we're aiming to make this pretty easy, sort of like how you would fill out, um, if you've ever used TurboTax, you enter your information and then it populates a form that looks very official, but uh, it would be fairly user friendly. And then the customer would receive notice from Duke Energy that they have been approved for the rebate. So they, there would be a communication from Duke Energy Progress or Duke Energy Carolinas to the customer that they've been approved for this amount of rebate. Now the cash wouldn't be sent immediately. The cash, the check, is sent upon completion of the installation. So the installer or an electrician um, or a uh, local code enforcement official would send a certificate of, a, of completion saying that this solar facility has been completed and is safe to operate to Duke Energy. When we receive that, we would then send the rebate to the customer or his designated representative. Um, and in parallel with that, there would be an interconnection agreement, um, which is, is a separate form. And then once the facility, and, and then there would also be an application for uh, either a net metering tariff or a purchase power tariff. So the customer would, and probably in consultation with the installer, would need to decide how they're going to configure the energy relative to the grid. Are they going to have the electrons flow to their home first or the electrons flow directly to the grid? So net metering or purchase power. So there would be that agreement. And then once all that's done and the facility's energized, uh, the customer has uh, part of his facility paid for uh, through this rebate and he's operational. And okay, once he's, before he's operational, does do you uh, check to make sure that the installment is meets all the 
proper standards? I believe that's a, a local uh, county building inspector. Okay. Correct me if I'm but wrong. But this is all Sorry. coordinated with, yes. with Duke? Yes. Okay. Um, so there are lots of checks and balances along the way, it sounds like. Yes, ma'am. And we are doing our, our level best to also educate uh, local code enforcement officials as well as uh, uh, fire protection um, officials, uh, first responders um, on this new landscape that's coming down the pike. Uh, the State Energy Office uh, together with South Carolina Electric and Gas and Duke Energy did uh, three workshops for local officials as well as first responders last week. We'll probably do another one this fall. So part of that education is to uh, put out some cautions as well mm -hmm. and oh. changes that will result yes, as far as the home goes. Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as maintenance and all. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so um, you've taught, you've, so when, uh, when they apply for the rebate, you said that's not until it's completed. They would make the application before they sign anything with the installer. So they would make the application at the time that they think, okay, I want to do this. Once they make that online application to Duke, we will then look at, look at the request and say, do we have available capacity under this tariff? Our solar rebate tariff has stated that this tariff is available at a dollar a watt for this amount of capacity. So we'll look at our actual versus max, max capacity and say, is there room in here? If there is, then we'll send a notice to the customer that if you complete, that you, we have reserved capacity for you under this rebate for 180 days. So please go complete your project, your installation within 180 days. Okay, and uh, will the process inform the customer uh, about all of the costs going forward and, um, and the benefits that they will receive as a result of this process? There are certain monetary benefits. We would like to provide the customer with uh, a checklist of questions you should ask your installer. Much of that depends on the nature of the conversation the customer is going to have at his kitchen table with the installer. We cannot control that conversation, but we will try to inform the customer of the questions he should be asking. But I'm talking about from the utilities point of view, the, the money, um, the benefits that they will receive as far as uh, the cost of having it and the benefits that that will accrue as far as their uh, utility bill. We are able to uh, describe to the customer if he takes the rebate, if they call our, our solar service center number um, and they say, I want to do net metering, we can describe um, based on past history what the net metering benefit would be. Uh, but again, that's just based on past history and a projection of the solar installation. It's not a guarantee of production. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, will the process inform them that this is not a static position and once you pay for it, that's not the end of it, that there could be ongoing changes possibly in tariff structure, um, regulations, say, that change along the way that could impact? We have stated that in the tariff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. And um, could you also uh, tell me, um, do you have any idea if this will increase or decrease the value of the home? Uh, Madam Commissioner, we believe the evidence is mixed. There Mr. Marino, um, if you can speak up, uh, I don't think the people in the back can hear you. Okay. I apologize. Um, based on the research that we've looked at, the evidence is, is mixed. Uh, there's some studies that point that the value of the home increases, and there's some studies that are inconclusive. Um, we believe that this market is, is new, and we're early in the cycle, really, to have a definitive opinion. 
Okay. And, and one other thing, we hear so much about cyber issues and breaches of data and information. Um, uh, do you have a process in place or a plan if those issues occur for the homeowner? I'm not qualified to answer that question, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm, I believe I'm not qualified either, but the processes that we're setting up in terms of how we are designing our systems that will enable uh, customer service for distributed energy resource customers are complying with the company standards for cybersecurity and data security. So does that standard include notifying the customer if something like that did occur? I suspect if that's part of our data security policy, it would, ma'am, but I can't speak But you're to not it. aware of mm -hmm. that. Okay. Uh, and um, I wanted to uh, hear a little bit more about the shared solar programs. Um, if you could talk, a, well, you've already talked about uh, who can participate. It, it pretty much sounds like it's an open door to anyone, though, that would decide that they wanted to go this route rather than putting panels on their home. We intend to market it specifically to uh, individuals and organizations uh, that would otherwise not adopt solar. So we intend to market it to nonprofits, houses of worship, perhaps National Guard installations, military installations. Uh, but we have, for simplicity's sake, left it open to all customers. Okay. And um, could you talk a little bit about uh, how the cost of that, the subscription fee, the initial fee, the monthly fee, um, and a little bit about when, how long it is before they will receive a payback from that? Sure, I, I can answer that. The um, Share Solar program has um, three key components. It has an initial small charge that customers have to pay. Uh, that is equal to $100 um, dollars per kW. It has a monthly subscription fee that the customers have to pay that equals $6 per kW. And then customers also receive a monthly credit for the energy that the facility produces. So they're entitled to the pro rata share of the production of the so um, shared solar facility. That's a credit to them on a monthly basis. The program was designed in a way that the difference between their monthly subscription fee and the monthly credit that they receive for the facility is a net, is a net positive to them. So that's where the bill savings come from. And in terms of payback, we're estimating that a typical customer will receive a payback um, within four years. Within four years of the program. Um, and it is a, a 10 year subscription, you said? It is a 10 year contract. Yes. Okay. And what happens when the subscription expires at the end of 10 years? At the end of the 10 years, we, uh, we foresee that the customer will have an option to uh, renew that subscription or sign up for other products that will be available at the time. But at this moment, there's not a provision in the program that uh, calls for an automatic renewal or calls for any terms today that will be applicable 10 years from now. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about if someone moves, um, how portable is that uh, subscription and what are the termination policies? We, we have termination provisions. Um, can't speak exactly to what they are because I don't recall those right at the moment. And in terms of portability, I don't have that information. Maybe I can that. answer that question, Commissioner. Okay. Um, if the customer, uh, for example, is uh, renting a home in um, Spartanburg and decides to move to Greer, both locations are in Duke Energy Carolina service territory. If they're moving within the service territory and they give us a call and say, hey, I'm moving, um, they may take their account number, and their shared solar subscription with them. Now, if they were to move from Greer to Florence, we'd have a problem. It's two separate utility companies. It would be no different from moving from Greer to uh, Columbia. We operate separate utilities, unfortunately. So um, if they're moving within the service territory and they give us prior notification, they can take it with them. So do they get a refund if they 
move to Florence? No, ma'am. Okay, so they, what they put in uh, stays there. Yes, ma'am. Even if it's before the four year. Yes, ma'am. I will note, uh, we, as a result of the settlement, we have differentiated the subscription fee for a business versus a residential customer. My colleague Jose just described the subscription fee for a business or for an organization. Um, a nonprofit would be $100 a kilowatt initial subscription fee in year one. For a residential customer, as a result of settlement, we have lowered that to $50 a kilowatt as an initial subscription fee. That results in a payback that's uh, two years? Close to two years. Close to two years. So if they were to move after two years, they would already be net cash flow positive. In other words, they, they wouldn't be out any money uh, based on our modeling. <coughs> okay. And um, was this program modeled after any other programs? Are there other programs similar to this throughout the country? There are um, many flavors of shared solar, sometimes called community solar. Uh, last I read, there are about 50 shared solar programs in America. Some result in bill savings, some don't result in bill savings. Uh, it really depends on the jurisdiction and why they were designed to reach what customer group and what that customer group desired. In some cases, customers desire to um, feel green. Um, I'm not terribly sure I can wrap my arms around that, but they, they desire to know that they're offsetting their energy usage with renewable energy. We felt in South Carolina that we needed to provide a product. The feel green products are typically premium products. In other words, it results in a bill increase. We felt in South Carolina it was very important for this program in order to get the adoption that Act 236 required and provide the access to solar that we interpret to be the intents of Act 236, that this resulted in something more tangible than greenness, that it resulted in bill savings. And, and there was information in the testimony about the siting, I mean, that you'd like to uh, have it near where the people are actually um, buying into the program. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and how large, like how many acres would one of these projects cover? Certainly. Um, ideally, community solar is sited in a community. We've talked about one megawatt increments being the ideal size for these. One megawatt of solar takes approximately five acres to build. So a half a megawatt's two and a half acres. Schools, new schools might have quite a bit of cleared acreage. Could you know part of the solar facility be on the perimeter of a school, providing the the you know viewable for several hundred students every day, perhaps with the kiosk that the kids could interact with every day. Perhaps the school could be a subscriber to it, and perhaps parents of children at the school could be subscribers to it. That, to me, is, as a parent, I think, an ideal situation, and as a business manager. So that's the type of siding that you will hope to achieve? Uh, yes. With the project. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, oh, uh, one other question. Uh, what if it's undersubscribed? Then we will adjust. I think that's. Uh, then you will like we will adjust. Adjust. We will adjust. We, if it's undersubscribed, it means that we have, uh, for some reason, designed it in a way that's not appealing to customers, um, and we will adjust. So that you plan to have the customers, you will make sure that the intent to, is to, to reach out to the customers. To make sure the customers realize the opportunity is there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one other thing. I'd did have a question here. Um, wanted, uh, is the 1,000 kilowatt limit um, the most cost-effective uh, cost way to meet this requirement? The law 
uh, as my colleague explained, has two tiers. Tier one is one to 10 megawatts. Tier two requires us to procure renewable, renewable capacity less than one megawatt in size. Um, that's to say that one to 10 megawatts solar at scale is more cost effective. Uh, one megawatt scale is less cost effective than 10 megawatt, uh, but it's, I'm not sure if the difference is that great. There's a much bigger difference between um, solar five kilowatts on your roof and the 10 megawatt scale than I think one in 10. So it's designed to meet the requirements of tier two? Yes, ma'am. Okay, as per at 236? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Commissioner Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm happy to have both of you with us today. I have a follow-up question on Ms. Pelt's your testimony that you in interchange with Commissioner Fleming uh, in the direct testimony, the shared program was a four-year payback. Did I understand you to say that it would be a cost plus, uh, effective payback after two years in the settlement? Yes, sir. So that that would be a change. If a if a customer decided to put a solar on his roof and not be a part of your program, what would the payback be then? May I ask my colleague Jose to answer that? Uh, um, sorry, the, the payback for customers that put solar on the roof is much longer, um, over 10, 15 years, depending on their specific rate schedule and load profile. And I guess that makes Commissioner Fleming's line of question on the educational part very important to the public. So it does. It does, certainly does. And one other question that uh, on the solar panels, on if if a solar panel is on a residential roof or if you put it on a commercial roof and the maintenance of the program would there be a difference in the cost had who's responsible for maintenance of, of the solar panels that's in your program i think maintenance would be pursuant to the agreement that you strike with your installer or your lessor um, often if if you're leasing a system, uh, then the owner of the system is responsible for maintenance, typically. They, the they, and the owner of the system is not the homeowner. The homeowner is simply leasing the equipment. Uh, if the customer were to enter into, uh, were to buy a system, uh, often there's a warranty on the piece of equipment that's most likely to need replacement, and that's the inverter. But as far as who's sweeping the leaves off the panels or the snow or windexing the panels, I think that's the homeowner. I think the homeowner's responsibility. Yes, sir. Okay. And one other question that we're always concerned about low income is are the cost and the benefits of this program totally within the subscribers to the program? There's no cross subsidization. Uh, okay. I, I, if you if you aren't a part of the program, do you have any cost? Yes, you would. Uh, your fuel factor, what uh, the component of your bill that uh, is uh, subject to the fuel factor, one element of the fuel factor now will be the DER incremental cost. Is this would this comply with the bill two thirty six? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Howard. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Felt, um, summarize for me the review and approval process for proposed modification of the DERPA program uh, according to the settlement agreement. Certainly. Um, in order to uh, respond in a timely manner to changes in the solar market to uh, tweak the program or if the program is really just not working as planned. For example, if we've mispriced the shared solar program or if we've, um, our rebates really are not incenting uh, customers to adopt solar. We have reached a settlement agreement whereby small changes, what we define to be changes no more than 25% in value. For example, uh, 
a dollar a watt rebate, if that were to change to a buck 30, that would be more than 25% change. Um, something more than 25%, we would bring that change to the commission for your consideration. We would also bring any new programs to the commission for your consideration. But if we were to change the rebate level from a buck to uh, a buck 20, uh, the settlement agreement requires us to reach out to the ORS and to the collaborative group that has been formed uh, to notify them of those changes and inform them of the need for those changes and then to refile that tariff and make that change. Thank you. Mr. Marino, um, in your direct testimony, you stated that the proposed level of incentives included in the share shared solar program were developed to produce approximately 9% bill savings for Duke Progress and 8% bill savings for Duke Carolina. Um, are these annual bill savings net of the customer's cost to participate in the program? Yes, the bill savings are net uh, from the perspective of the customer cash flow needs. So if a customer has to pay a certain amount of money up front to apply for the program, the subsequent annual bill savings that will result from the credit that they receive and the monthly subscription that they pay will help offset that upfront investment. So the 9 and 8% will still be their savings? Yes, sir. Let me ask you another question. On solar panels, you're going by nameplate capacity, correct? That is in DC current, FDC. However, it would go through an inverter and turn to AC. What is the difference to change from the DC nameplate capacity that you'd be charging versus going through the inverter and the customer be using on the other end an AC current? The value for that factor that we've modeled is um, We adjust it by 0.77. So if, if we're talking in AC terms, and um, we divide that number by 0.77 to get to DC terms, if we're talking in DC terms, we multiply that number. I'm sorry, if we're talking in AC terms, we multiply that number by 0.77. To, um, I'm, I'm saying that incorrectly. If our numbers are stated in AC terms, and we need to convert them to DC terms, we, pro we multiply that number times 1.3. 1 1.3. 1 .3. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner Elam. Right. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to follow up a little bit uh, on some of the uh, discussion of benefits uh, to the solar customer. Um, are there any issues that you're aware of, whether uh, a customer is leasing a solar panel on his roof or owning the solar panel on his roof where there are issues with their homeowner's insurance? I'm not qualified to answer that question. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't believe we have that information. Okay. Um, no issues about who works on the roof and wor what, what, whether or not uh, you're allowed to put something on your roof. Not aware of that? from any other programs? I am aware of issues that mortgage lenders may have. Mm -hmm. And could you describe those? It's, I would prefer to follow up with you, Commissioner. Okay. It's okay. been a while. Um, and, and your mention of TurboTax got me thinking about the tax credits. Could you discuss what tax credits are available uh, to customers who participate in the program? Sure. Um, currently, we've assumed that there are two types of taxes, tax credits available to customers. The first one is the federal tax credit, which is 30 percent, and the second one is the South Carolina state tax credit, which is 25 percent. Okay. And those um, can be uh, spread out over years? That's a tax benefit that applies um, depending on the customer's tax position. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit is short term, so you okay. can offset your tax liability by the value of that tax credit immediately to the extent that you have tax liability. Okay. 
Um, Ms. Bell, um, I sort of back up just a little bit. You were involved in, participated in uh, the generic proceeding that yes, the commission sir. had. And you're generally familiar with the settlement agreement. In yes, that, sir. Uh, if I could just <coughs> paraphrase, I know you don't have, probably don't have this in front of you. So I do. You do? Well, that's fine. <laughs> if you could go to page 4 of 25. In doc, this is in docket 2014-246E mm -hmm. in the settlement agreement, paragraph 7. I'm sorry, in the commission order or the... The, the settlement agreement, it says 4 of 25 at the bottom and 4 of 29 at the top. From the generic document. Okay, I'm on page 4 of 29. Okay, uh, paragraph 7. Yes, sir. The settlement agreement shall expire on January 1, 2021. Yes, sir. Okay. In that sec in that paragraph, it just it says, and I'm paraphrasing, that utilities are supposed to file net metering tariffs uh, that will make uh, the services available to customers on a first come, first serve basis. Correct. Yes, sir. Is Duke's plan or Duke Carolina's Duke Progress in this proceed these proceedings? Mm -hmm. Are they up on a first come, first serve basis? These rebates or these tariffs? Yeah, the, the, the rebates. The rebates, yes, sir. First come, first serve. Okay, so there is a, a ceiling, a cap of the benefits? Yes, or, sir. Okay. As described in Act 236, and we're you, using those capacities as the caps. And you just, there's only a certain number of new uh, slots available to customers every year who, who want to take advantage of the program. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, I have some others, but maybe I will ask those of Ms. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Whitfield. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good to have both of you with us today. Uh, just a couple of questions for, for each of you. Um, I guess, Ms. Felt, you first. Um, the settlement agreements re reduce the avoided cost tariff eligibility for facilities from not in excess of, of five megawatts to those not in excess of two megawatts and extends the term uh, to 10 years. Uh, I guess, first of all, what's the reason for this reduction? Certainly. Uh, the reason for that reduction stems from conversations that we had in furtherance of settlement with the Solar Business Alliance. And they brought up a really good point. If our, our initial filing of solar rebates stated that we would offer a rebate to a commercial customer of 75 cents a watt. Now, they brought to our attention that if an industrial customer, for example, takes that rebate and then uh, decides to net meter, net metering is, uh, is really just a kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour exchange. Now, an industrial customer in South Carolina in our, uh, in our territories might be paying six cents a kilowatt hour or five cents a kilowatt hour. So net metering is really not, not that lucrative for them in terms of um, enabling a revenue stream that will support the installation of this solar. And they brought to our attention that uh, an industrial or a commercial customer more, would be more likely to then sell all the electricity to the utility and enter into a purchase power agreement with us. A purchase power agreement would be our CSP 30A tariff or uh, Schedule PP. Um, and those tariffs, as available today, delineate a term of one, three, or five years, depending on the jurisdiction. It was brought to our attention that for an industrial customer, that's really not a financeable revenue stream that for um, um, a big box retailer or for a large industrial customer, in order to get permission from headquarters to make this investment, they would need not just the rebate, but security that that avoided cost payment would recur for some predictable length of time. And so we made the modification to enable, to further our chances of reaching the penetration levels, reaching the adoption for industrial customers. 
and commercial customers. The change in the eligibility from five megawatts to two megawatts was informed by a desire to really target this modification to the avoided cost to the capacities described in Act 236, really to target it to very small scale generation. Uh, one to two megawatts of solar, although that's five or 10 acres of solar, is considered in today's environment relatively small installations. They call it baby ground mount. So, so your uh, reduction was as a result of the settlement. I think you said 75 cents for commercial, of course, a dollar for residential, but your concern was the um, more so in the, the industrial um, users, and, and that was brought to your attention, or, or the reduction was as a result of the settlement agreement mm -hmm. and, and brought, and so your, I guess your increase in, your, your intent is to increase the potential for market for, um, uh, I guess, smaller scale, you, you use the word baby, but uh, smaller scale uh, DER. Yes, sir. Less than one megawatt DER. Um, what will this reduction do? How will it impact e existing facilities? that are already subject to check I don't know if I, I would I would really have to check uh, I think existing facilities um, would r remain on their tariffs until their tariffs expire and if they are not subject to the eligibility stated in the tariff they would simply assert that they're a qualifying facility and we would negotiate an avoided cost rate and term as um, a qualifying facility. You want to maybe get a late filed exhibit for that or, or follow up or do you, do you know Mr. Marino? I do not, sir. Okay. Um, well, if we can get a late filed exhibit um, regarding that, um, how the reduction will impact existing facilities. Um, Ms. Felt, we would appreciate that. We'll do. Please. Um, um, and that late field exhibit will be hearing exhibit number three. In both. I'm okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Castle. Can we just get a clarification on what the exact substance of the late filed exhibit is to be in terms of the question to be answered? Um, how, how, go ahead. Ms. How, how the. Uh, how the reduction would impact the existing facilities, the reduction from five megawatts down to two megawatts. So in terms of their contract status with the company um, and their future eligibility for the standard tariff? Right. And will they okay. remain on the tariff right. as Ms. Felt thinks? Correct. Or? Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask counsel for Duke Energy and Progress if there is anyone here who can answer the question? Well, it's a legal question. Um, I'm, I'm certainly qualified to, to speak to it, but I think in large part it's governed by the terms of our existing tariffs with our customers. Um, on the Duke Energy Progress side, our Schedule CSP 30A rate is a variable rate, so that resets every time that we update that tariff. Generally, the contracts that we enter into with those customers are one year evergreen until such time that the rate is updated. So to the extent that a customer would remain eligible for our CSP 30A rate, meaning that they would be under two megawatts in size, they would still be eligible for our CSP, the next iteration rate. They'd probably have the option of selecting a one, five, or 10 year rate under the new tariff structure. However, if they were over two megawatts, as Ms. Felt uh, referenced, they would have to negotiate a rate subject to PURPA with the company. Um, similar to what we filed uh, with the Commission on the Darlington Solar PPA executed between DEP and Darlington Solar. On the DEC side, we have currently available uh, one-year and five-year rate options for customers eligible for Schedule PP. Upon the implementation of the new tariffs, we would have variable five-year and ten-year options for customers no greater than two megawatts. So the situation would be the same for those facilities less than two megawatts in size, as in on the DEP side. 
um, but on the uh, larger than two megawatts, they would have to negotiate a contract with us as, as would the DEP customers. Customers that have existing contracts in place today on the DEC side that say entered into a five-year deal last year, those PPAs remain in place until such time that it expires uh, pursuant to the terms of that agreement. And at such time, after that agreement is over, they can either, if they're eligible for the standard tariff because of their size, select um, a new rate there, or they can, could, could negotiate a new um, PPA with us subject to the requirements of PERPA. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Maybe if he could put that in writing, maybe in the late file exhibit, or perhaps maybe in the proposed orders, maybe you could address this so that we don't leave this uh, unaddressed. Absolutely. I think we, the, the company would prefer to submit that in the late filed exhibit requested by the okay. commissioner. So we'll do All right. That. So we'll just get that in writing. And as I said, that'll be hearing exhibit number three for both dockets. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Also, uh, along those lines, Ms. Felt, um, if you could, on that same subject, could you, could you maybe discuss the typical size of a residential solar installation uh, or the typical size of a non-residential solar installation? I think I heard you say one megawatt, five acres a little bit ago. If you could maybe discuss the size of, of, of these for us, I, I would appreciate that. Certainly. Uh, typically, a residential customer would install uh, four to five kilowatts DC. Uh, a typical uh, commercial customer size is going to vary by the commercial customer's um, uh, demand as well as by his available rooftop space or uh, available uh, space you know, next to his facility, ground mount space. As you're aware, the net metering statute requires that if a customer uh, or limits the eligibility of the tariff to the customer's, um, if non-residential, to the customer's uh, contract demand and uh, so a customer would not be able to put on more solar than his contract demand if they were non-residential. So if a commercial customer's contract demand were 20 kilowatts, then that would be the upper limit of the solar that he would be able to install and net meter. Now he could install more and simply enter into a power purchase agreement with the company. But if he were to net meter, there would be an upper limit on that. As to trends in large-scale ground mount, my colleague Jose can probably speak to those. And in, in for um, large-scale facilities um, or ground mount facilities, they really vary in size from 250 kW all the way up to 10, 20, <coughs> etc. Thank you. Um, one more question, and, and this is probably more for you, Mr. Marino. Um, on page 10 of your direct testimony, and I'll give you a second if you need to get there. Okay. I'm done. You, you state that the, the upfront cost of a solar facility and the projected declining energy production profile driven by panel degradation are the main reasons why it does not represent a better alternative than the company's electric rate under present conditions. Um, from table one, also on your page 10, and the next accompanying text, it appears that, that this will be the case over the next 25 years, even considering the proposed rider, riders and rebates. How long do the company's proposed to provide incentives to encourage adoption of, of solar facilities by customers? We propose to provide incentives for the next four years. By 2020, the program ends. 20. Or until we reach the capacity stipulated in Act 236. Comply with the Act? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marino. That's that's all I have, Madam Chairman. All right, commissioners, any other questions for Ms. Felt or Mr. Marino? 
Okay, Mr. Castle, any redirect before we excuse these witnesses? I just have a few questions. Okay. Um, Ms. Felt, this is, these few questions are intended to respond to questioning from Commissioner Fleming, mostly for clarification purposes. Um, is it the company's intention to include uh, additional information on its website for customers that want to either lease or purchase solar facilities? Yes. And there'll be information available on that website related to all of the customer programs we're talking about today? Yes. Um, on the shared solar program, um, you, Commissioner Fleming asked you some questions around uh, a customer leaving the service territory or terminating their subscription. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, isn't it true that there is no additional termination charge that a customer would have to pay if they did choose to walk away from the program? There is no termination or exit fee. Thank you. Um, another question that Commissioner Fleming asked you was about uh, whether the it, what happens if the um, program the shared solar program was undersubscribed do you remember that yes is is the company's planned approach to build out the program in tranches targeted at that issue yes in our initial tranche of four megawatts i think that's <coughs> roughly one megawatt in duke energy progress three in duke energy carolinas that will be executed in 2016. the idea is to segue into this um, and see if it works. And then if it is subscribed, we would do another tranche in 17 and another tranche in 18 and 19. So in sum, the company's not gonna build out the full amount of shared solar that it wants to build and hope that customers sign up. That's correct, it is not a build it and they will come. No. So it's not gonna overbuild the capacity? No, we will not. Okay. Um, in response to um, questioning from Commissioner Howard, you described the parameters around the modification process under the settlement? Yes. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify, would, would, all, would all changes to any tar tariffs, regardless of the um, impact on charges or credits, would, would all of those be filed with the commission? Absolutely. Okay. But some of those would only be filed for notice and not with a request for re approval, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Commissioner Elam asked you some questions on um, limitations on installing solar on someone's rooftop from either homeowners insurance or mortgage lenders. That's correct. Do you think there might be some other witnesses from other parties uh, to this proceeding that might be qualified to speak to those issues? Yes. Might. Witness Barnes from TASC be able to speak to those questions? Sure hope so. Okay. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Elam, uh, Commissioner Elam also asked you about, um, I think, the uh, participation limits in our programs, and particularly as it pertains to the solar rebate program. Does the settlement agreement affect the calendar year approach that was proposed in the application? Yes, the settlement agreement removes the calendar year approach. Our filed tariffs on February 9th stated that this year up to eight, we'll, we'll offer rebates for up to, uh, I think it was six or eight uh, megawatts of capacity. Uh, and once that capacity is subscribed, this tariff expires until the next calendar year. It was brought to our attention by a number of intervening parties that that really, uh, induces a stop-start market. So we modified the program such that when this tranche of capacity is subscribed, the company will suspend that tariff at that rebate level and reissue another tariff with a new capacity limit at a new rebate level to keep the, to keep the uh, I guess, the momentum in the market rolling. Those are all the questions I have, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, well, um, then Ms. Felt, Mr. Marino, you may be excused. And Mr. Castle, you may call your next witness whenever you're ready.
you state your name for the record, please, Ms. Smith? Uh, Kim A. Smith. And by whom are you employed and in what capacity? I'm employed by Duke Energy Carolinas, the Department of Energy Resources. Okay. And um, Madam Chair, we're going to go through. Ms. Smith, uh, if you can speak directly into that microphone, please. Bring. Okay, it's on. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Madam Chair, we, we will go through, as the other witnesses, we'll go through the Duke Energy Progress <laughs> testimony and then the Duke Energy Carolinas uh, testimony, as the other witnesses have. Uh, Ms. Smith, have you caused to be prepared uh, direct testimony that was filed in uh, docket 2015-53E on behalf of Duke Energy Progress? Yes, sir. And does that testimony consist of, I think, 16 pages of questions and answers? Yes, sir and five exhibits? Yes. Okay, now we're talking about the direct testimony. Um, or do you have any changes to that testimony? I do. Would you describe the change, please? Yes, on page five, line 20, <coughs> we have section 58-40-10F6. It should be section 58-40-20F6. Okay. With that change that you've described, if I were to ask you the questions contained in your pre-filed testimony today, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would. Madam Chair, we'd ask that Ms. Smith's direct testimony uh, on behalf of Duke Energy Progress be copied into the record as if given from the stand. All right, Ms. Smith's direct testimony will be entered into the record as if given orally from the stand. And we would ask that Ms. Smith's uh, five exhibits um, be filed uh, in the record of the case as the next hearing exhibit. All right, uh, Ms. Smith's five exhibits, one through five, will be entered into the record as hearing exhibit number four. And Ms. Smith, did you cause to be prepared four pages of rebuttal testimony that was filed in docket 2015-53E? Yes, sir. And do you have any changes in the rebuttal? No, I do not. If I were to ask you the questions contained in your rebuttal testimony today, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would. Okay. Madam Chair, we ask that Ms. Smith's rebuttal testimony on behalf of Duke Energy Progress be read into the record as if given from the stand. All right, Ms. Smith's rebuttal testimony will be read into the record as if given orally. And Ms. Smith, would you summarize your direct and rebuttal testimony on behalf of Duke Energy Progress, please? Yes. Good morning. My direct testimony provides Duke Energy Progress's actual DER incremental and avoided cost data for March 1st, 2014 through February 28th, 2015, the review period. The projected DER incremental and avoided cost information for March, 15, March 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2015, the forecast period, and the proposed DER incremental and avoided cost factors by customer class for July 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2016, the billing period. In addition, my testimony describes and supports the parameters used for allocating costs and establishing billing factors for customer classes. In this proceeding, the company is seeking approval of its DER programs and its proposed method of allocating and recovering the incremental and avoided cost of such programs. The company will seek actual recovery of those costs in its annual fuel proceeding. Act 236 defines incremental cost as all reasonable and prudent costs incurred by an electric utility to implement a distributed energy resource program. Incremental costs include, but are not limited to, the cost an electric utility incurs in excess of the electric, electrical utility's avoided cost rate, the full cost of electric electrical utilities investment in non-generating distributed energy resources, such as, but not limited to, energy storage devices, the electrical utilities weighted average cost of capital as applied to the electric, electric, electric utilities investment in distributed energy resources, expenses associated with a project, asset, or program under generally accepted principles of regulatory or utility accounting or accounting orders issued by the commission and the electrical utilities incremental labor cost associated with implementing the distributed energy program. Act 236 defines, defines avoided costs for purposes of separating total DER program costs between incremental and avoided costs as all costs paid under avoided cost rates or negotiated rates pursuant to PURPA, whichever is lower. In South Carolina Code 58139, 
5-110B avoided costs are further defined, indicating that they are to be rates most recently approved by the Commission or negotiated pursuant to PURPA. In its application, Duke Energy Progress DER incremental costs include the following categories of costs. Costs associated with PPAs in excess of the company's avoided cost rate, the DER net energy metering, the NEM incentive, which is a credit available to eligible NEM customer generators approved in docket number 2014-246E, avoided capacity costs associated with NIM, recoverable as an incremental cost based on section 58-40-20F6, rebates given to residential and non-residential customers to invest in or lease distributed generation and carrying costs related to the amortization of the rebate amounts. A subsidy utilized to lower the subscription charge customers will pay to participate in a shared solar program and general and administrative costs, which include the cost of developing and implementing programs, cost of incremental labor, and additional revenue grade meters. The company's avoided cost in the application include the amounts paid under avoided cost rates or rates negotiated pursuant to PURPA for PPAs and amounts paid for the purchase of power from participants in the shared in the solar rebate and shared solar programs at the company's avoided cost rates. Pursuant to Act 236, the company proposes to allocate the incremental and avoided cost of its DER programs and NEM based on the same method that is used by the utility to allocate and recover variable environmental cost. Duke Energy Progress allocates environmental costs to the, to the rate classes based upon the firm peak demand experienced in the prior year. Although it recovers variable environmental costs on a per kilowatt or per kilowatt hour basis, depending on the rate class, for purposes of DER recovery, the company proposes to divide each class's allocated portion of incremental cost by the number of accounts subject to DER in each class. This method results in an annual dollar per account charge for all accounts subject to DER in each class. The annual charge is a fixed monthly charge added to the fuel factor for each class of customer. The company believes a fixed per account charge is the best way of ensuring that the statutory cost caps are not exceeded. DEP proposes that the alloc allocated portion of incremental DER charges for each customer class will be billed to customers on a dollar per account basis, since such charges are capped on a per account basis. The company believes that the per account recovery approach is appropriate since South Carolina Code 58-27-865 does not prescribe a particular billing unit for cost recovered under this section and the company has historically used different options, both rates per kilowatt hour and rates per kilowatt. Also, since the per account caps have been established based on class groupings of residential, commercial, and industrial, the company will conform its firm peak demand allocators to those groupings. Although the company is proposing to recover its incremental costs through a per account charge, it is important to note that it will recover its avoided cost in the exact same manner as its variable environmental cost. In the event the incremental cap cost to be recovered from any customer class in a given year exceed the per account annual cost cap set forth in South Carolina Code 58-39-150, the company proposes to carry forward any such cost in excess of the per account annual cost caps for recovery with carrying cost through the fuel factor as an incremental DER cost in a subsequent year. The total under-recovered cost from all customer classes and interest will be allocated among all customer classes per the firm peak demand method and recovered through the billing factors established for the subsequent year. For purposes of the, the determining the per account charge, the company proposes to apply the charge to all accounts, metered and unmetered, serving the same customer of the same revenue classification located on the same or contiguous properties, with the exception of accounts which serve in an auxiliary role to a primary account on the same premise. 
The company believes that exempting the accounts described above recognizes that the legislation included a provision to limit the impact of DER programs on customer rates by setting a rate cap. This concludes a summary of my direct testimony. My rebuttal testimony responds to the testimony of Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and Coastal Conservation League witness John D. Wilson to clarify that in the event that the company acquires or constructs DER generation to meet the Act 236 requirements, both the incremental and the avoided cost portions of the investment would be recovered through the DER company's DER component to the overall fuel factor and that the company's approved avoided cost rates or negotiated rates pursuant to PURPA will provide the threshold for separating avoided from incremental cost. This concludes a summary of my rebuttal testimony. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, did you also cause testimony to be pre-filed in docket 2015-55E on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas? Yes, I did. Okay. And was that direct testimony consisting of 16 pages of questions and answers? Yes, sir. And do you have a correction to that testimony? Yes, I do. I have the same correction I had to um, the Duke Energy Progress testimony on page 5, line 20. Um, the section 58-40-10F6 should be 58-40-20F6. With that correction, if I were to ask you the questions contained in your pre-filed direct testimony on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would. Okay. Madam Chair, we'd ask that Ms. Smith's direct testimony on, in docket 2015-55E on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas be copied in the record as if given from the stand. All right, Ms. Smith's direct testimony will be entered into the record as if given orally. Did you have uh, five exhibits uh, attached to your direct testimony uh, on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas, Ms. Smith? Yes, sir. Madam Chair, we would ask that the five exhibits be uh, entered into the record as the next hearing exhibit. Okay, Ms. Smith's five um, exhibits will be entered into the record as hearing exhibit number four. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Smith, did you submit rebuttal testimony in docket 2015-55E? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes to the rebuttal testimony? No, I do not. If I were to ask you the questions in the testimony, would your answers be the same? Yes, sir. Madam Chair, we'd ask that Ms. Smith's rebuttal testimony on behalf of Duke Energy Carolina be read into the record as if given from the stand. Okay, Ms. Smith's rebuttal testimony in 55E will be read into the record as if given orally. And Ms. Test uh, Ms. Smith, would you summarize your Duke Energy Carolina's uh, direct and rebuttal testimony, please. Yes. For the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolina's LLC in docket number 2015-55-E, I will adopt the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress, Inc. provided in docket number 2015-53-E, subject to the following change specific to Duke Energy Carolina's DER program application. My testimony on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas provides the company's actual DER incremental and avoided cost data for June 1, 2014 through May 31, 2015, the review period, the projected DER incremental and avoided cost information for June 1, 2015 through September 30, 2015, the forecast period, and the proposed DER incremental and avoided cost factors by customer class for its proposed billing period of October 1st, 2015 through September 30th, 2016. Also, for purposes of the billing, the annual per account charge, Duke Energy Carolinas proposes to apply the charge to each account defined as an agreement or tariff rate between Duke Energy Carolinas and a customer, with the exception that certain accounts will not receive the per account charge because of the near certainty that these agreements represent small auxiliary service loads associated with other primary residential, commercial, or industrial service accounts on which the charge will be assessed. In all other respects, my summary of my testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Progress 
provides the summary of my testimony filed on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas. This concludes the summary of my direct and rebuttal testimony. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Please answer any questions, the commissioners. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Gallin, any questions for Ms. Smith? No, ma'am, thank no you. No questions. All right, commissioners, questions for Ms. Smith? Commissioner Elam. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, in your pre-filed uh, direct testimony, you reference uh, Code Section 58-39-150, um, correct? Yes, sir. And that section essentially states that the commission shall not approve a DER program where, where the cost busts that cap of a uh, dollar a month for residential, $12 a year, and the, the other figures for the industrial and the commercial, correct? Correct. Um, You've done some projections in your testimony, I believe, as to what the expected costs for year one through five are. That's correct. Okay, I have. can you summarize what your projections are? The uh, projections for the incremental cost for each class for Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas all fall below the cap for each uh, customer class. $12 for residential, 120 for commercial and 1200 for industrial. So they all are below the 12, the 120 or the 1200. Okay. Is that true for all five years? Um, on our projections right now, no, it is not true for all five years. Okay. I want to get to the uh, proposal that's been put forward in the settlement agreement about carrying forward excess. Okay. Um, now, now, you said you don't expect it, I guess, until the, the later period of the five years, but just hypothetically, okay. if, if costs uh, for a residential class uh, were, say, instead of $12 for the first year, that they were $24, mm -hmm. you got just an incredible response. Uh, the customers let's back up here what are you going to charge for year one do you have a do you have a base charge you're going to start uh yes we do have a base charge and um the charges currently in my testimony mm -hmm. do not reflect the changes we've made during the settlement okay so they the charges we do expect to incur will be filed with the fuel fi with the respective fuel filings either the de well the dep fuel filings already been made so there will be a subsequent supplemental DEP fuel filing once these programs are approved and we know what so we can rerun our numbers but um, so yes but we expect the residential charge to be below the one dollar per month for all the resident all the residential customers and now you, you asked me what would happen if it was well over if the actual ended up being over if it ended up being over you proposed uh, to not go above that dollar and we will not go above collecting from the customer to carry over mm -hmm. those costs to year two mm -hmm. and recover it as part of the fuel factor well it will, what will happen is say let's say for example um, with the residential as an example say for the residential customers if you take the number of accounts times the twelve dollars a year we came to a million dollars we could collect from that certain class of customers. And we had this huge response and it turned out that on the overall DER costs, we um, spent $2 million more. The residential customers allocation of the actual DER incremental cost would be $2 million. So what we would do is carry that $2 million over as a DER incremental cost in the next year and we would allocate that two million dollar or that million dollars I'm sorry the extra million dollars plus the carrying cost among all the customer classes okay. well, let, let me see if I can get it straight would the carryover costs be part of the dollar a month yes or would it, it would be, be separate from in another portion of the fuel factor no it would be part of the dollar per month so, so their customers never get charged more than the cap. Okay. If you have very good response throughout 
the five years. Mm -hmm. And you are never able to go above that dollar for five years, and you still have unrecovered costs. What then? Uh, we would just carry them forward. But I think the way the, they have done their projections that we may be not be able to recover all of our costs in one certain year from, it's usually residential and industrial customers due to the allocations. But after that, we'll be able to recover. So they, they're, they're not projecting to really spend more than we can recover from our customers. Okay. Um, that. So it is, because you're not going, and I'm, I'm just That's fine. limiting it's, this to the residential, because you're mm -hmm. limiting it to the dollar a month, that's why you're saying that that how that complies uh, with 58 uh, 39 150 yes and in addition to the um, end of the five years if you uh, exhaust all that set cost recovery ability mm -hmm. before you reach the target um, installed capacity of, of the uh, two percent mm -hmm. I'm sorry the two percent limit it just keeps going yes sir it will okay. and like like with the uh, we were talking about the 10 year subscription uh -huh. earlier that will go on for we'll have DER charges for more than five years the okay. DER incremental they will go on until all the programs are finished and we don't have the DER programs anymore. Just we have to meet our percentage of solar in five years, but the actual program costs will go on after those five years. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Um, now, now, your company's fuel factors charged to customers begin with a South Carolina-based fuel uh, factor that'll in now include DER costs, right? Yes, sir. Um, could you list the various factors, uh, such as the South Carolina environmental factor, uh, that will be added to or subtracted from the company's fuel factors? Oh, okay. So, like, what the new fuel Correct. tariff sheet will look out, look like? Yes. Okay. So we'll have the um, the base fuel, like we've had. And then we'll have the environmental fuel factor still. And then last year we added the Act 236 purchase power fuel factor. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have a, um, a fuel factor related to the avoided cost, the purchase power, that will be separate. And then we'll also have a dollar per account charge. And so all that will be on the fuel tariff sheet. Okay. So, so the DER cost components will be separately identified. Yes, sir. Uh, on, on page nine of your direct testimony, uh, you, you discussed transparency of the per account annual cap. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. um, will the charge per account be published in the tariff? It'll be published in the tariff and it will actually show up on their bill. Okay. And that, that will probably change every year? Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. but, but, what point just after the fuel factor uh, it will change with the new fuel rate so for example DEP's new fuel rate goes into effect every July 1st so that factor will change every July 1st okay mm -hmm. and for Duke Energy Carolinas it will change October 1st with the new fuel factor okay of each year and whenever you finally complete the merger you have no idea what happens in it right <laughs> I'm going by then, so. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, uh, the charge will be printed as a line item on customer bills. I believe you said that. Yes, sir. What will it say? Oh, I don't know. We. Well, do you have any any just notion about how it will appear on a customer's uh, maybe bill? Maybe the distributed energy resource which charge. Will, which will probably do nothing but pr prompt well, phone calls on this they will and we had uh, we've had similar situations in other states where we had a new line item and our customer service center will be prepared to tell them what the distributed energy resource charge is 
did you did you change what was on the bill as a result of uh, the, the telephone experience? No, we didn't. And a lot of people won't notice until it gets a little larger. You know, the residential customers with a dollar, it just depends. I think something happened with your microphone, Ms. Smith. We can't oh. hear you anymore. Am I still there? Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so. Well, I've seen customers complain about a nickel well, that's on true. the bill. <laughs> so um, you may be a bit optimistic. Yeah, um, I might be. Will there be more of an explanation printed, I, I don't know, on the back of the bill, in a paragraph on the bill on the first time uh, it no, we, shows we have up? The, the customer notice that goes out with the fuel, so it'll go out along with the customer service. You know, Just, the customer notice that we send uh, out. Bill, bill insert? Yes. That, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that probably, unfortunately, a great deal of time makes it into the trash before it's uh, ever looked at. That is true, yes. And um, we'll also have our website, you know, which has the information. Okay. So I guess they can call that. So, so if you get a call from, from a customer saying, are you telling me I'm paying for my neighbor's solar panels? I don't want to do that. You, you tell him what? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Well, we say, you know, we're, uh, we are implementing a new law in South Carolina for, to encourage solar renewable generation and um, Due to that law, we are allowed to recover the cost of this from every customer. Okay. Thank you. I, I might like to be around to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to oh, say. Oh, I know. Believe me. So. Good yeah. luck with that. So. <laughs> I have nothing further. Thank I you. guess we better get our story straight for that. So <laughs> okay. Um, we'll break for lunch now. We will resume at 145.